This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Whereas residual income and return on investment were methods which you had been introduced to in F5, the next topic, economic value added, is new and, and for your studies, unique to P5. And it comes up very often indeed. So you need, really need to, to understand how the calculations work. Now, in essence, the calculations are very similar in principle to residual income. We have the operating profit after tax. Uh, and then from that, you subtract uh, an amount for a notional charge for the use of capital. And that's based on the weighted average cost of capital uh, applied to the capital employed. A couple of things to note at this stage. First of all, NOPAT does not feature on the income statement. If you think about the income statement, you have operating profit and then you have interest and then you have tax, and then you have the profit after interest in tax. But no PAT is before interest and after tax. So we have to do an adjustment uh, to find out what this no PAT is. That's the first of several adjustments that has to be done. Secondly, uh, there is a little bit of a question mark on the capital employed? Is it opening or closing capital employed? And it is always the capital employed at the start of the period. And one of the commonest errors that people make is they take the capital employed at the end of the period. Now you could put up an argument that it should be the end of the period or halfway through the period, but it is the start of the period. Uh, effectively Economic value added is defined like this because economic value added, when you see reference to it in uh, uh, textbooks or the internet, wherever you are, uh, is always written as EVA or should be written like this EVA and a little TM. And TM means trademark. So this is a trademark or proprietary approach uh, of a firm of analysts called Stern Stewart. And you might disagree with some of the things that they do, but that's, that's not really the point. This is their methodology, and this is what you have to follow. What uh, adjustments do we have to do? And some of these will be a little bit surprising, uh, potentially. So here's a list of the main uh, uh, adjustments, really, to NOPAT and sometimes to the capital employed as well. First of all, intangibles, particularly research expenditure and marketing costs. Prudence and accounting standards will normally suggest that this type of expenditure is written off because the future income flows from it are really quite uncertain. However, economic value added doesn't really make use of uh, accounting standards. Uh, and what they're arguing here is that research in a way, ought to be encouraged. Marketing ought to be encouraged. And this is, if you like, laying up treasure for the future. And they say that you shouldn't uh, deduct marketing expenditure or research expenditure from the income statement. And it, effectively, it should all be capitalized. Goodwill written off. They don't want there. The, the problem with goodwill written off, it's uh, often a very arbitrary figure. Uh, based on your assessment of the uh, uh, the uh, the way goodwill may have been impaired. Uh, and so what we need to do is to add that back to net profit uh, and also add back to the capital employed as it was never written off. Depreciation. Uh, book depreciation, again, is excessively arbitrary. It doesn't really link to any uh, cash flows. What uh, you will have to do under this method is to replace that by what's called accounting depreciation. 
Now you don't need to know really what accounting depreciation is uh, or how to calculate it. If needed, you will be told what this is in the question. So you would add back book depreciation and take off the accounting depreciation. A big one. You, 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 you add back the accounting depreciation and you subtract the economic depreciation. 90% of the time in your questions, yet you're told that these are the same. So the net effect is zero. Provisions such as bad debts, again, these are regarded as being excessively arbitrary. Uh, it, you know, a general uh, uh, irre irrecoverable debt provision should be set at kind of 20,000, 10,000, 50,000 and so on. Uh, they are a bit suspicious, suspicious uh, about these kind of general provisions. Uh, similarly, uh, I don't think it's listed here, but you've got something called non-cash expenses in general. So non-cash expenses, uh, which will typically be a provision, are not to be debited from the income statement. They need to be added back to that. Leased assets. Uh, if you have uh, leased assets uh, under an operating lease, uh, if you didn't add those back to capital employed, uh, you are effectively understating the capital employed. So any uh, non-capitalized leased assets have to be added back there. And finally, interest and debt capital. If we want to get to NOPAT, uh, we start with the profit after tax. You have to add back the interest. But note here, uh, that uh, we have to make a little adjustment on tax relief. And we'll see see how that is in a moment, basically. Debt is treated as part of the capital employed, uh, and we make essentially a charge for that through the weighted average cost of capital calculation. What we want to find is a positive economic value added. Think of residual income. We have the NOPAT, uh, then we take off a charge of the use of capital. We uh, want to end up in pocket. We want to end up with a positive number. OK, well, we'll see, first of all, a simple example that's not in your notes. And then we'll go on. We'll go slowly through the example, which is in your notes. So here we have the simple example. Uh, two years. We have the income statement at the top. We have uh, essentially the, the, the capital employed at the, the bottom. We'd have the weighted average cost of capital uh, in here. We have non-cash expenses of 10120 uh, for each of those years. And what we uh, need to do is to work out, really only we can do this for 2015, and we can only do it for 2015 uh, because we don't uh, really know what the starting capital employed was for 2014. I know you could kind of maybe kind of work back and take off the profit and so on, but we really don't know whether during 2014 more share capital was issued. So it has to be the opening capital employed. So let's uh, let's kind of work through this uh, fairly simply, really, fairly kind of slowly, and we'll start with the uh, kind of no pat calculation. Now let's just to get clear on this interest adjustment. Let's, for the time being, forget that we have any non-cash expenses. Okay, we'll we'll we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Okay. Uh, what we want to get to is the NOPAT figure, net operating profit after tax, but before interest. And there are basically two places you can start uh, to get this. We're only doing it for 2015, okay? So NOPAT. The first place uh, we could start uh, is at the 2000. So we could start at profit before interest, and then we could say to ourselves, right, if there isn't any interest to be charged against that, what will the tax be? 
the net operating profit after the tax on the operating profit. So the tax would be, so this is the, the profit before interest. And if we ignored the interest entirely, and the tax is at 25%, we're going to have 500 deducted from that. We're going to have 1,500. Or what you can do is you can start with the profit after tax, the 500. And then what we do is we have to add back the tax. I beg your pardon, you have to add back the interest. Okay, so it's after tax, and what we'll do is add back the interest. But the interest which is effectively in that 1200 has enjoyed tax relief. So there has been 400 interest, less 25% of that, less 100 tax relief. The net effect uh, within that 1200 of interest is 300. So if we're adding back the interest, it is going to be the 400 of interest times 1 minus 0.25 we're going to be adding back 300. And we're going to get the same in both of those. Exactly the same in both of those. What we then have to do is look at the notes that will be provided in the, uh, the question. And we'll see here that the non-cash expenses in that year of 100. Okay, so non-cash expenses of 100 and they shouldn't be deducted from no pat or from profit so we're going to add those back so non-cash expenses so that is not really no pat that is no pat before we do this adjustment if you follow me so non-cash expenses the plus 100 so our proper no pat whichever way you're going to be doing it it's going to be 1600. Okay, so that's, uh, if you like, the um, notepad figure. What we have to find now is the opening capital employed and apply to that the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so let's think about uh, what the opening capital employed would be should be at 2015 so capital employed at start of 2015 now you might think that that should be 8000 so in other words the closing capital employed a year end capital employed at the end of 2014 will be the opening capital employed at the beginning of 2015. However, in that capital employed, we have deducted an expense of 120, non-cash expenses, which should not have been deducted in 2014. Indeed, we've added it back in 2015. So if we'd never, ever deducted these non-cash expenses, then the capital at the start of the year, the 8,000 plus 120, is going to be 9120. So the economic value added is going to be the NOPAT figure less a charge based on the weighted average cost of capital, 15% times the adjusted or corrected opening capital employed. Uh, so this, of course, is wrong. It's 8120 uh, times 8120, like that. So we have uh, in here uh, 0.15 times 8120. 
PF382. Economic value added of 382. And that's, that's quite good. Uh, we've been trading. We have made essentially no part of 1600. And even after paying for our use of capital, uh, uh, accounting for the weighted average cost of capital, maybe our holding company has to pay or group head office has to pay, we still come out ahead of the game at 382. Okay. That was a simple example. You won't get anything, or you're unlikely to get anything as simple as that in the exam. Let's look at a fairly comprehensive example, and you're actually unlikely to get anything more complicated than this example in your exam. And this is the example which is in your uh, study notes. Uh, so we'll we'll go through this kind of really quite carefully. So we have the income statement, we have the balance sheets, okay? And then uh, there's a great list of notes uh, here. Uh, and this time we want to work out the economic value added for both 2013 and 2014. And we can probably do that because we have capital employed at the end of 2012, which will be the capital employed at the beginning of 2013. Okay, so we'll just read through these notes because we'll have to keep referring to them and trying to remember about them as we go through. So the company had non-capitalized leases valued at 16 million in each of the years. The leases are not subject to amortization. So we have to bring those back into the statement of financial position, basically. The value of the pre-tax cost of debt was estimated at 9% and 10% in 2014. So pre-tax cost of debt, this is going to be coming into our weighted average cost of capital calculation. Usually in these, you're given cost of equity, cost of debt, and you weight them uh, according to the old F9 weighted average cost of capital calculations. And here, note 4 gives you the cost of equity for the two years. And then in note 5, it gives you the target capital structure, which gives you the weighting factors, 70%, 30%. Rate of tax was 30% in both years. Economic depreciation amounted to 64 in 2013 and 72 in 2014. These amounts were equal to the depreciation used for tax purposes and the depreciation charge in income statements. So this means that if you were to add back book depreciation and subtract the economic depreciation, since you end up where you start, uh, so you can you can leave those adjustments out in this situation. If they were different, you would add back book depreciation, you would subtract the economic depreciation. Interest payable is there. We're going to have to think about adding that, make an adjustment for, for that to get to our notepad. Other non-cash expenses were 20 million and 15 million. Research and development expenditure on a new project started in 2013 and written off, and that should be two Fs in there, uh, was 10 million in 2013 and 11 million in 2014. So quite a lot of notes, quite a lot of things to go through really, really carefully when we're doing this. Okay, so let's uh, start here and we'll start getting towards the notepad. We're doing it for 2014 and we're doing it for 2013. And I will start, as I said, it doesn't matter where you start, but I will start with the profit after tax. Uh, dividends are irrelevant here, so I'll start with the 88 and the 71. So profit after tax, 88 and 71. Next I'll do, uh, it doesn't really matter what we, we do next, let's add back the interest effect here. So interest adjustment. Uh, 
And the interest we were told about in here, uh, where interest payments went to 6 million and 8 million in 2014. Because it doesn't say separately what these are. It just gives us pre tax accounting profit. So this pre tax accounting profit is going to be after the interest. That's why we're told this in note 8 here. Amounted to 6 million and 8 million. So it'll be 8 million and 6 million. But it says here that interest payable amounted to that. Uh, the, the tax will have saved, you know, we'll have saved some tax in this here. So what we have to do is to remember to do the 1 minus the tax in there. Okay, The 8 million of interest hasn't really, isn't really in that 88, if you know what I mean. There's 8 million interest in there, less the tax relief. And that's why when we're adding back the interest, you only can add back what was essentially taken off. And the tax rates uh, which were being applied here was 30%. So the amounts we're going to be thinking of adding back here is going to be uh, 5.6 for that one. And in here it's going to be 4.2 for that one. Non-cash expenses are always uh, fairly easy. Uh, here we have non-cash expenses, 20 million and 15 million. There is no taxation adjustment on those. Most non-cash expenses will not have enjoyed tax relief anyway, if you think of a general provision on, on, on irrecoverable debts. So 15 million and 20 million. Like that. So non-cash expenses. Research and development. Research and development expenditure on a new project was 10 million and 11 million. So that should not have been expensed in 2014 and 2013. Uh, so there's going to be 11 million and 10 million. Research and development. Anything else to worry about in terms of adjusting our income statement? Let's just go through here. Capital, uh, that's 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 uh, non-capitalized leases is to do with the capital employed. We have whack, whack, whack. We've got taxation that we know about. Economic depreciation, we've covered. And we, we, we know we don't have to do anything with that because it's equal to the book depreciation. We've added back the interest. After tax, we have added back the non-cash expenses and research and development we've added back as well. So this will give us our two notepad figures uh, in here. So we have 88 plus 5.6 plus 15 plus 11, 119.6. Uh, we have 71 plus 4.2 it is, 4.2 plus 13, 105.2. So let's think about the capital employed. Capital employed at the start of the period, the start of the period. So what will we uh, pick up uh, here? We can go back here and I will pick up this 400 at the end of 2013 and we are told 350 at the start of 2013 so 400 and 350 okay that is the brought forward okay couple employed and what we have to do then is to be essentially consistent okay as far as we can be okay so we had some non-cash expenses in 2013 if those non-cash expenses of 20 had not been deducted in 2013 
then the brought forward capital employed there would be 20. Okay, so non cash expenses. Essentially, we don't know from the information given here, capital employed at the beginning of 2012, 350, we don't know if there's actually anything relating to 2012 previously which should be added back to that. We, we're not given any of this historical information, so we can't make a figure up in there. We just have to leave it like that. Okay. Next thing we can look at is research and development. We're on slightly better ground in research and development. It says the project started in 2013. Okay, 2013, and 10 million was written off in 2013. Again, if that 10 million hadn't been written off in 2013, we'd have 10 in there. And there's definitely nothing in there because the project started in 2013. And finally, we have some information about non-capitalized leases in here. 16 million in each of the years, 2012 to 2014. Uh, they had always been brought in, that we'd have another 16 million in each of those. Sorry, my pen is not writing with a, a mouse. So it's going to be 16 million in each of these, okay? So what we're going to be ending up with as a capital employed, 400, 430, 400, we're going to be ending up there with 446. We're going to be ending up here with 366. So we have our capital employed, we have our notepad, and the last step will be to work out the weighted average cost of capital and charge the notepad for the use of these two capital amounts. What we have to do now is to work out the weighted average cost of capital. And the uh, information was given back here. Uh, here we uh, have the debt, the equity, and the weighting, the mix of those two. So, weighted average cost of capital will be as follows for 2013. Debt at 9%, and debt is making up 30%. Equity at 15%, and equity is making up 70%. So, 30 and 70 and we're dealing with uh, 9 and 15. So, weighted average cost of capital, 2013, we have equity 70%, and the cost of equity in 2013 uh, was uh, going to be 15%, uh, and we have 30%, as debt and the cost of debt in 2013 uh, and was it pre-tax or post-tax? Pre-tax cost of debt 9%. Weighted average cost of capital takes the post-tax cost of debt so it's going to be 9% uh, less the 30% for tax. So we're really going to be looking here 30% uh, times 9% uh, times 1 minus 0 0.3. Okay, so we're looking in here at 0 0.3 times 9 times 0 0.7. Let's turn it on. 0 0.3 times 9 times 0 0.7. That's 1.89 uh, plus 0 0.7 times 15 equals 12.39 and for 2014 it's going to be 70% and 30% again 
we're going to have this 1 minus 0 0.3 uh, going in there. And the two rates which we had, 10% for debt and 17% for equity. So 17 and 10. So in here, we have for the debt, we have 0.3 times 10 times 0.7 plus uh, 0.7 times 17. Or oh, that's really, you know, 17% is going to be 14. So exactly 14%. So the economic value added for the two uh, periods, 2013, it's going to be the NOPAT figure which we got back here. And in 2013, the NOPAT figure was in here, 105.2 minus 12.39% uh, times the capital employed. And the capital employed we got to for 2013 was this rather badly written 366. So 0 0.1239 times 366 is going to give us about 59.85. Let me just calculate that that is um, okay. Uh, we have 105.2, which is correct. Okay, 59.85. For 2014, the NOPAD figure was 119.6, and the uh, 14% is going to be the, uh, the weighted average cost of capital. And the capital employed in 2014, as adjusted, was this 446. So we have 0.14 times 446. Fifty-seven sixteen. So we've had uh, economic value added in 2013 of nearly 60, uh, economic value in 2014 only about 57. Both are nice and positive, so we are uh, you know, adding economic value. Uh, but the I suppose the performance in 2014 isn't just as good as it was in 2013. Now it's just quite complicated. You know, you, you really need to do examples to be, uh, you know, get get kind of confident in in that. Uh, in the real world, economic value added calculations, kind of over a hundred different adjustments for you to do. So count yourself lucky if you only have these ones to do. Um, economic value added can be used to compare divisions, but quite often it's used just to see how one company is doing from one year to the next, that it is earning enough to pay for its capital. 